Lord, Father, we just thank you that, that we get to be here, Lord, and we get to come here and worship you, and uh, we get to do it freely, Lord. And um, I pray that you prepare our hearts, Lord, and that we, uh, that, uh, that, Lord, that we invite your, your spirit to speak in this worship this morning. We love you so much. I don't know about you, but there's a song here we're going to sing here in a little bit that says every hour and every second we need him. So I don't know about you, but I need him every second, every hour, every day of my life. Because I wouldn't be who I am today without him. Without him changing me and changing my heart and softening it, I wouldn't be who I am today.
this one's a new song. Um, I sang this uh, for worship night um, yesterday. Um, this is a new song. Like I was saying, this in the first verse it says, "Every hour, every second, every heartbreak, and every blessing, you can have it all." So I want, I want God to have every burden that I that I, I store for myself. I want Him to have it all because it's, it, when I when I try to do it by myself, it's it's hard for me. Really overwhelmed with everything, with it, and as everybody else does, with work, you know, home, kids, all that stuff, you know. But it's 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 the fact of surrendering your your burdens and your life to Him, because He's he He'll take care of it all with the snap of a finger. He has so much power to do that. We just have to let Him. I'm gonna need your guys' help on this one.
Every hour, every second, every heartbreak, every blessing, you can have it all.
if you guys have your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark 11. Mark 11. I want to to read it for us this morning, and then we'll come back to it. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, these disciples, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus went, sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And we'll send it back here immediately. And they went around, they went away and found a cold tide at the outside of the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they, they told them what Jesus had said, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, and it was as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What we get to see here is, the Lord's, if we call it, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And what we get to see, as we'll see here this morning, is, is things unfold of, of failed expectations. Many of us suffer from failed expectations. If we're honest and true with ourselves, we've, we, we have these expectations, not, upon, not only on ourselves, but of others and of things. And oftentimes we're disappointed because we seemingly are let down. I'm sure all of you have experienced failed expectations one way or another in our lifetime, or many. Every single day we hold on to certain kinds of expectations about ourselves, about others, about our circumstances. They're supposed to be a certain way. Whether we realize it or not, these expectations directly influence our lives and how we live them. In fact, we're always told We always hold on to conscious and unconscious expectations in various situations. We hold on to those because we're expecting a certain outcome if we think about it. But the expectations we hold on to influence where our our focus is and where it will go. They usually determine where we're going to go next by what that tells us. These types of explanations include our attitude, our decisions, our behaviors, our perspectives, as well as our interactions with others. But often our expectations are flawed because they distort our understanding of reality to our detriment because we're expecting this certain thing and it's our detriment, but it doesn't happen. And then we fall on this failed expectation. Hopefully, as we move into today's passage, we're going to see those that rallied around Jesus before his capture were greatly disappointed because they too had a skewed field, a skewed view and a failed expectation on what he had come to do. As we look at this chapter in Mark, Mark 11 begins with the last chapter in our Lord's earthly life, many calling it, as we call it, the Passion Week. We're in this Passion Week as of right now. This is a busy and active week where we conclude in His death and resurrection, His glorious resurrection. This is that week. It begins with the arrival of Jesus during Passover, of a lot of people being in Jerusalem at the time, as we call it, the triumphal entry. If you remember up to this point, Jesus had had rebuked people for telling about what He was doing in the miracles. Don't tell anybody. He healed this person. He did that miracle and He told them, Keep silent, but not anymore. Even in the last chapter, he doesn't tell Bartimaeus, this blind man, to stay quiet any longer. 
He doesn't try to hush the crowd. The time has come for an open confrontation with the Jewish leaders in the city of God, Jerusalem. He's ready to face the music, as we call it. For an open display of who he was, the Messiah. No longer concealing his his identity, but he's going to reveal it to everyone right now. And people are going to recognize this as they're putting down these palm branches, as they're putting down their cloaks, their jackets on the floor for him to walk on. It was a time for everyone to see who he really was and why he'd come. Now, looking at these first few verses, when they drew near to uh, Jerusalem and Bethpage and the Mount of Olives, Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples and said, go to the village in front of you. And they, they go and they have to untie this colt that one no one has ridden on. But in verse 3, it blows my mind what is said in verse 3. It says, the Lord has need of it. There was something as I read it, there's something that I couldn't stop and, and stop looking at. It was, the Lord had need over it. Think about that. The Lord had need of this particular cult. When did God ever need anything? He owned all things, yet he possessed nothing. He created the stars, yet he had nowhere to lay his head. He fashioned everything out of nothing, yet he had to borrow a boat to preach the gospel. He created every drop of water that exists in this world, yet... He cried, I thirst when he was dying on the cross. He created every tree, but he died on a borrowed cross. He created every rock, but he had to borrow a tomb in which to be buried. He used the clouds, it tells us, as chariots in Psalm 104, yet he had to borrow a donkey in which to ride. What a paradox of his life what this thing that he had come to. He was rich. He was in heaven. He was on the throne. Yet he made himself poor so that those who believe on him might enjoy his riches. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God. You know, the Lord could save sinners and accomplish His work here on earth, fine without us. Yet He chooses to use frail human instruments for His glory. First Corinthians 1, Paul talking to the church in Corinth, says in verse 26 through 29, he says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that a few of you are wise in the world's eyes, Few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful, wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the the world, things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised of the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. He used the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The nothings, the nobodies to further his kingdom. When we, you and I are like this donkey in this story here, untied from sin and redeemed, he can use us too. When we're no longer tied up and enslaved to that sin, Being a little donkey isn't so bad when Jesus is your master. Just look at what this donkey did. Look at what he did. He got to to carry the king of glory into Jerusalem. Something that everybody would count it as loss brought the king of kings into Jerusalem. The Lord used him as a vehicle to give glory to his name. That's what he wants to do with us. To use us to bring him glory. That's it. 
We don't have to arrive on this big horse with this fancy tack in all of this chariot. But someone may be not noticed that only brings notice to the king of glory by the way we're living our lives. They see the king of glory in us. That there's a triumph that happened within us because of the way we're living life. Someone asked Francis of Assisi, many of you guys know who that is, how he was able to accomplish so much in his ministry, and he replied, this may be why. The Lord looked down from heaven and said, where can I find the weakest, littlest man on earth? And he saw me and said, I found him. I will work through him, and he won't be proud of it. He'll see that I'm only using him because of his insignificance. We get to see the significance of John the Baptist say, I must decrease while he increases in that. It's not about me, it's about him. Again in Matthew 5, verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is heaven in heaven. By the way we are working and doing things unto the Lord, the way we're living lives, may they glory in who God is because of what He's done in us. We're epistles read by all men. What does it say? You know, many times we have failed expectations because what we're doing is we're looking for what He can do for us rather than what we can do for Him. That's where we get it wrong. What are you going to do for me, God, instead of what can I do for you, God? So in verse 4, he says, And they went around, away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to him, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what, uh, what Jesus had said, and they let him go. I was reading through this, and I was thinking it must have been a different time, a different culture in that day for that to happen. I was thinking from my South Valley perspective, if I was in that day and hour, and it was here in the South Valley, you're going to go into someone's yard, someone's yard, and you're going to take their colt. They're probably going to show you a colt. <laughs> their response, you, what are you going to do? What? what are you going to do, Essa? You know what I mean? I could just see it. I was like... The Jesus wants this. Yeah, yeah, I'll save it. You know what I mean? Like, so it was a different time, a different culture in what they understood. Jesus' purpose in riding into Jerusalem was to make public his claim to be their Messiah and the King of Israel. It was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. We even get to see just one out of Zechariah 9.9. Zechariah 9.9 tells us, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is, yes, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. He became nothing so that we could be something. This was significant because to the people at that time, it showed that he came in peace. He didn't come on a war horse where he came to object. We get to see him come right in in peace. Also, we look at this, uh, the significant amount of, the, uh, amount of olives. Jesus said he would come again in the same way he had watched him go. This is going to be that place. Also in Zechariah 14.4, tells us what will happen when those holy feet touch down once again where he left. The very location where David wept in defeat in 2 Samuel with Absalom and where Jesus was betrayed and rejected will be the place Jesus returns in triumph over all his enemies. He'll return to this place. Verse 7. 
And when they had brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road. Others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the field. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. There was this big hype going on. The people are just throwing stuff down. Even like, wow, what's going on here? Even watchers and passerbys. But think for a moment. When Mark wrote this, and the first people to read this, what would, what would the message have been conveyed to them? What would they have thought as they read this message? These Christians in Rome. No doubt, many of them had seen generals enter in on these big horses and these big entourages for accolades. They were wanting to receive accolades from the people. How stark the contrast between Roman glory and Jesus' humility here, riding in on a donkey. Unfortunately, the praise of the people that lavished on Jesus was not because they recognized him as their savior, but he was a savior for their sin. They welcomed him out of their desire for, they wanted to deliver, to smash Rome. That's what they were looking for, someone to overtake Rome so they could live at peace. There were many who thought they didn't believe in Christ the Savior at the time. Nevertheless, they hoped that in hopes that he would rise up and have this revolt against Rome, they would follow him too as a temporal deliverer. These are the ones who hailed him as king with their many hosannas, recognizing him as the son of David who came in the name of the Lord. But they had, he had failed in their expectations. When he refused to lead them in a massive revolt against the Roman emperors and occupiers, the crowd quickly turned on him. Within just a few days, days, their hosannas would change the cries of crucify, crucify. You were once great, but now you're not great because you failed me. That's what they were saying. You would have thought at this time the Sadducees and the Pharisees would have been looking to him. They would have been looking. They had been searching the scriptures waiting for this man's arrival or the Lord's arrival. But they allowed their expectations of what the Messiah would look like or be like caused them to miss him. He's supposed to come in on this big horse. He's supposed to be a certain way. He's supposed to do a certain thing. Yet he failed them in their own eyes. Something that's not brought out in Mark's gospel here, it's, it's in Luke's gospel. In Luke 19, 38 through 40, his disciples were saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. That's blasphemy. Why are they speaking this? Look at verse 40. He answered, I tell you, if, the, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I will be praised. As the worship team sang just a little bit, I will not let the rocks cry out. I will be the first to praise you. I don't giving them, I ain't giving them a chance to cry out. But I will cry out. But I, I get to recognize the, the entry, the triumphal entry he came when he came into my heart and rescued me and started to clean out the muck and the mire in my own life. And is still doing that. But he failed their expectations. How many of you have those same failed expectations this morning? Failed because we want out of this world the messes of our life, the things that we've done in our life, we want out. Lord, my life isn't what it's supposed to be. God, why aren't you doing something in my life right now? Lord, can't you see my struggles? Jesus is the anointed one who redeemed his people, you and I, as foretold by the prophets of old. 
He came as God incarnate, fully God yet fully man, so that his shed blood would pay the full price of our bottomless swamp of sin. What Jesus did upon the cross was to redeem us. That's what we needed most. We needed saving, and that's what he came to do, and that's what he did. You and I shouldn't have any failed expectations. Because what he said he came to do, he did. We needed saving from the rap sheet that we had acquired. And he says, I'm coming to take that away on the cross. My blood will make you clean. If there was not anything else that God ever done in our lives, that's what we needed the most, and he did it. Many think of Jesus as a genie in the bottle. We only rub it when things are hard. (laughs) We laugh, but that's what we do. We only rub him when times are hard instead of seeking him wholeheartedly every single day. There's triumph in him, not in ourselves, not in me, not in you. In Christ alone. There's times in my life I can declare to you, I've said, God, you've let me down. But the truth be told, I let myself down because I had my, I had my own plans and my own expectations. And when God's plan wasn't my plan, I got upset. God, you're you're supposed to be uh, according to my plans, in my ways. And I have failed expectations because they didn't plan out that way. They didn't pan out the way I wanted. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us this. The Lord speaking, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours. And my thoughts, higher than your thoughts. As I speak for myself, so many times I have thoughts on how things should be. But as we've learned, we don't think as the same as he does. But I must learn how to trust him and know what he's doing. What is God doing in our lives? I don't know. But we need to allow Him to work and to trust Him and say, I don't know what you're doing in my life right now, but I'm going to trust you. And my life may be falling apart. But we must understand that Jesus didn't come to conquer by force, but by love by grace, by mercy, his sacrifice on the cross for his people. He conquers not nations, but hearts and minds of his people. That's what he came to conquer, is that we would let go of us and be more of him. How do we further the gospel when we have our own agenda? How many of us want to ride in on a donkey, especially nowadays? According to the world standard, it's not cool. You've got to be a certain way. You've got to look a certain way. If Jesus had made a triumphal entry into, into our hearts, he reigns there, and it should be a place of love. As his followers, we should be exhibiting those same qualities that he came to exhibit in us. As we got to see, we have a, a perfect example We should exhibit the same qualities and the world sees the true king living and triumphing in our own lives. We see this passage of scripture begin with such a great promise only to end in rejection and hatred towards him. 
I think many people in that same thing happen with failed expectations because they think when they come to Christ, everything's going to fall into place and all the pieces are going to be put in. And they, I'm sure they are, but they don't look like what we think they look like. He's going to put them into a place where it's probably not going to be so nice for us. But he knows what we need at the time we need it. Lastly, in verse 11, it says, And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He looked around at everything, looking with sadness. Where was everybody? Where was the crowd now? What happened with all the excitement and all the expectations? Everybody was singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory in the highest. And now there was no one around. What are the disciples thinking? Wow, what's such a big crowd? There's nobody here now. We're alone. When Jesus looks around today, what does he see, what does he see when he comes to our churches? As he walks up and down our aisles, moves in and out of our chairs, what does Jesus see when he looks in the temple of our hearts in our own lives? Who triumphs there? Who lives there? He knows what we look like on the inside. He knows what we're really, what's really important to us. He knows where we spend our time. He knows where we spend our money. When Jesus looks into our heart, what does he see? You know, this morning, we mustn't ignore. A simple celebration is, is in discipleship. The celebration was in discipleship. Enthusiasm isn't faith. It wasn't building upon their faith. Have we responded to Jesus as our king? Many of us have excitement surrounding Jesus. People are excited. I see people in this church that are excited. But without a genuine submission, submission to him and without worship in their hearts. Excitement over Jesus has stopped short of worshiping him as king overall quickly fades away. I want to ask you this morning, will you surrender to him this morning? Will you surrender to his will, to his way, regardless of what it looks like? As I've shared with you many times, we'll say, thy will be done. Do you really want his will to be done? Let him work. We're tested by fire. There's dross. There's so many different things that we deal with. But at the end, is he triumphing? Let him be your triumph. He came to save us. He did what he said he was going to do. Now we must just live in his riches, he's called us. And I'm not talking monetarily, but of who he is. He gives us a peace. He gives us a strength. He gives us a security. He gives us what we need to live day by day. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. That's got its own worries. Worry about today. How's today look? Are you willing to surrender and leave all your expectations at the cross this morning? At Jesus' feet, where he paid in full everything. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out. I'm going to cry out. This day as we, as we move into this week, I just pray that we stop and think about what, how much triumph he's brought you and I. And if we're not living in victory, we're not living in triumph, we're living on failed expectations. Because we're living according to what we thought it was supposed to be, not according to what he has already done cross is the truth. He paid the penalty. What we needed for each one of us because he loved us that much.
Why don't we stand? Father, I, I stand here this, this morning, Lord, and seemingly in disgust, Lord, because I've let you, you down and you've never let me down. Help me to see where my focus ought to be. Help me not to be distracted by the things to the left or to the right that take my eyes off of you. Father, I want you to triumph in me this morning. I want you to triumph in us. That we're not taken away off into these rabbit trails, Father, of thinking. But, Father, that we'd focus on the triumph that you brought. The King of glory. I mean, nothing else matter, Lord. For those that are not living in that victory, Lord, I just ask that you draw them to yourself this morning. That they too can live in that victory. And, Lord, that you would rule and reign in their own hearts, Lord. Help us not to have failed expectations. Help us live to live according to your word, your way. Help us to understand your word in a way that's clear, a way that we can live it. Help us to be untied, Lord, from sin this morning. We lay those things at your feet this morning and praise you and we tell you, Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. We thank you in Jesus' name.